Well, praise the Lord. That was a blessing. Amen. Amen. It's the easiest way to make music, by the way. I know we had an instrument, but is the, you know, God gave you that, that voice. You know, and if it is a, a good voice, uh, it really doesn't need training unless it's going to be performed, you know, um, I shouldn't say publicly, but professionally. Uh, I mean, you, you sing in the shower, right? Uh, listen, we have um, this morning, uh, Anne is visiting with us. She's off on my left. So uh, if you have an opportunity, right after service, rush over there and shake hands with, with her, if you would. And we're glad that she is with us today. Uh, like I said, I wanted this to be a kind of a fun sermon. Uh, there, we are, we're going to be turning in our Bible. So I hope, hopefully you have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible and you want a Bible in your lap, raise your hand if you don't have one yet, and you want one. So one will hand you a Bible. Brother uh, Paul is waving that uh, sword of the Spirit over there. All right, no takers, that's fine. All right, First Samuel, First Samuel. Uh, if I mention the name Samson, uh, good or bad, in a traditional uh, church, you, you have this bad feeling. Anybody, Mary, you're hot, huh? You're warm, you, is that a hot flash? Um, uh, all right. Anybody hot? I'm up, I'm up here, so I'm not actually, I, sh I should be the one that's hot, and I, 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 I feel okay. Tough. <laughs> I know you didn't say anything, but you're fanning yourself, man. that's all right. All right, if you, we say uh, uh, Samson, generally we get a bad feeling. But I preached on it. I only preached on it once. Uh, I th oh, I know the, the sermon title was Saints in the Savior's Hand. What did Samson have in his hand that where he slew 3,000, huh? The jawbone of an ass, ass, the very first thing to be redeemed, redeemed in the Bible, is the what? By a sheep, by a lamb, is the ass. Folks, we are the ass. Amen. All right? That's what we are. And uh, we're... Uh, we're made alive in Christ. We're dead to our old nature. We're that jawbone, and he uses us. Now, folks, these stories are not in the Bible just to have stories in the Bible, but they're there for our instruction if we really want to learn. Now, I thought I'd preach on this fellow. We, we'll look at a half a dozen or more verses where we're going to go to. We have 50-some verses today. We'll just read those verses off. But 1 Samuel chapter 9. Did I tell you to go there? 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. We are going to preach on Saul, King Saul. A good feeling or a bad feeling? I asked uh, uh, Brother Welsh, and he had uh, no feeling. He was... Uh, I said, good, bad, or indifferent. He, he didn't say any of them, so I would call that more indifferent. He, he feels good, he feels bad. He, you know, kind of, good feeling, bad feeling. Now, be honest. Yes? Sad. Sad. Oh, it is a sad story. But we're looking beyond all that, beyond that story, as a sad story. So uh, we're, we're preaching him. Uh, what role does Pharaoh play in the Bible. Two extremes. Go ahead. He plays God the Father. So Pharaoh can be God, and Pharaoh can also be what? The devil. I mean, he could play God Almighty, and he could play the role of the devil. All right, it's not just a story, it's there for our instruction. Now, Saul plays all kinds of roles. He plays the story of a lost man. He plays the story of a preacher. 
I might not name these off as we go. He, 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 he is a great preacher. He plays the part of a lost man. He plays the part of a saved man. He plays the part of Christ. He plays those things, and we'll see that as we go. So we're, we're going to, uh, it is Memorial Day. And, uh, I, I preach a message, God bless America, again. I, I don't uh, feel led to ever preach it again. I preached it twice here. And uh, when we were way up, up there years ago, 15, 16, 17 years ago, I preached it twice. But uh, we're, uh, I am a patriotic to this book, our country, and, and so on. So we're going to do that. We're grateful for the men that have sacrificed their lives, for the many uh, in our country, amen, that are dead and buried, have gone on before us and so on. But uh, today we will preach on Saul. And I want us to end in light of Memorial Day, we will be preaching, and I mention it in here someplace, the captain of our salvation, which is Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. May we see King Saul in a different light as we have never seen him before. And maybe when we read these stories that we would be looking for our Savior to reveal himself and to show himself through the lattice, as your word says. Now, in Christ's name I pray, amen. So I do anticipate doing this book, and maybe just by publishing sermons about Christ showing himself through the lattice. Saul! Saul, a few named in the Bible. There's more than one Saul in the Bible. There's the New Testament Saul, which is Paul, King Saul, and so on. There are others. There's ones before that in Genesis named. A few named in the Bible. But Saul of Kish, Saul of Kish, by far the one named most often. If you go and look up the name Saul, his name is named many, many times. Many, many times in the Bible. Saul, how do you feel? Good or bad? Apparently it was neither. It was sad, right? Not good, neither good nor bad, but sad. It is a sad story. Uh, good or bad? What says ye? What says ye? A choice young man and a goodly, says God. It's what it says. A choice young man and a goodly, says God. Here in uh, verse 2, And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. Uh, now, if we look at this, uh, that was verse 3. That was verse 3. Look in verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. Now, uh, I want you to now think about that. Now, now just slow down and think about that. Uh, tall people generally, because of their physical... Um, overbearing tend to be more successful than short people. I believe that is a statistical fact. Uh, Cyberling, uh, is that the Goodyear? Goodyear. Was he a tall person or a short person? He was a short person. So short uh, for he and his wife, they had little stools under the table when they ate to put their feet up on. They're, they're very short people. So it, you know, uh, not all short people are unsuccessful. In light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, don't say you're wrong. I want you to say when we're done with this that I'm right. He was higher than any of the people. What part of Christ's story is that? Other than the ascension. And I, if I be lifted up, what is it? The crucifixion. Do you see that? Is that far-fetched? It's not far-fetched, folks. When you read these stories, it's there. Higher than any of the people. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. 
So 1 Samuel 9, 2, when he's hired, means it, it points to the crucifixion. Now, I've given some of these. I only had three of them listed, but now I have a half a dozen or so listed uh, in here. Uh, Kish, the father of Saul, then represents what it, as far as it, in the Godhead. What is Kish? I want you to go ahead and interpret this on your own. Who is Kish? He's not the devil. God the Father. Saul, the son of Kish, then becomes Christ the Son. He takes, he doesn't take the servants, he takes one of the servants with him, which would represent the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> one of the servants. And it says, and I'll take one of the servants with thee, and arise. What does uh, arise then mean? That becomes what? Coming up out of that grave alive, it represents the resurrection, right? And seek the asses, seeking the lost, who will become saved, and the Christians, us. What part, how could that not be that? That is not reaching for straws, that's not, that is... <coughs> As far as preachers, I think you would have a whole pot debating that and uh, finding fault. What could be more simple? <clears throat> Unless one chooses to be as Peter writes, they willingly are ignorant. Or as writes Paul, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In other words, they willingly don't want to see those things. Look at verse 1. Kish what does it say at the very end? He was a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Where does all power come from? All power comes from God. So there it is, God and all the power. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Where did Christ get it? He got it from God the Father. So this theme of the crucifixion, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the lost, the saved, the power, the resurrection is woven through the entire Bible. If you read Arthur Pink and you read about the creation, the, the six days, seven days of creation, you'll find the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ through all of that. And he it gives that when you read those commentaries on Genesis. Right from the very beginning, all of these stories are woven into the Bible for you and I to find. Truly Christ is standing behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, like looking and peeking out a window, showing himself through the lattice. He reveals himself through the lattice and we look and take a peek and there he is, Christ is showing himself. It's like finding buried treasure. I want to make this like a, uh, a treasure hunt. Who here doesn't want to go on a treasure hunt? Right, every little kid, uh, adults too. You hope it's buried in the wall someplace. When you, you're breaking down a wall to do a little rehab, you hope you find something that somebody left behind, right? It's like find buried treasure. Such treasures are hidden amongst the stuff, just waiting to be discovered. Like Joseph's silver cup in the neck of Benjamin's sack. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, right? Being Memorial Day. It is going to be Memorial Day tomorrow, and seeing Christ is our hero, you know, this is a, a, like a regular novel. There is the enemy, you know, the arch enemy in the book, the devil. There is the hero of the book. He wants to get the girl, which is the church, and so on. There's a fight for that. Uh, the book is like that. And Christ is our hero, the captain of our salvation. Like Pharaoh, which plays in type the devil and God both. Saul plays different roles. So may the reading and the preaching of God's word today be a blessing to all who look for God's riches. Amen. So let's begin here. If you would turn to, we're going to turn to a few places today. Uh, we normally don't do that in, uh, in morning service. But 1 Samuel 16, verse 17. By the way, where does Goliath show up? Chapter 17. When we think of Saul, King David, and, and all that, we think of uh, a hinging around uh, the, the showing up of Goliath. <clears throat> now, my 
uh, these may not all be sayings, but I have I have seven points. The seven sayings of Saul. We uh, the title here today for me is just Saul, but you can use the the seven sayings of Saul. First uh, Samuel sixteen. You know when when he uh, when David arrives on the scene, Saul acts like ever wonder about. I wonder about these. Saul acts like he doesn't even know him. Have you wondered about that? In the, after it's all said and done, who's his general? Uh, Abner. Abner was quite a general. He says, who is this guy? That's going to be one of our points. Who is this guy? But he already met him before. Doesn't that uh, make you wonder about that? How could he be so oblivious? So it begins here, our first one, in uh, 1 Samuel 16. Now, if you're only a casual reader of the Bible and maybe not know all of these stories, hopefully it will whet your appetite or your taste so that you will want to read these stories and, and, and get real familiar with the Bible. Look at verse 17. Remember, uh, the spirit left Saul, an evil spirit came upon Saul, and he was troubled. Remember, he, he then is troubled. Folks, lost people are troubled. Very, very troubled. And it can come and go. If the calves lost, they could, I mean, they could really be in a bind. Right? For you and I, it shouldn't make one bit of difference. But people's lives hinge on this stuff. Yeah. And they can, become, they can become distraught over the easiest and littlest of things. Very distraught. And, and then David, uh, before this, Samuel had anointed David as king, and the spirit left Saul. Uh, it's a sad story. And Saul becomes very distraught. But if David is a type of Jesus Christ, and he is, he comes to Saul to comfort him. Doesn't he do that? Listen, it's Memorial Day tomorrow. There's going to be all kinds of picnics, right? There's going to be people where lost people are at, saved people are at. And in general, everybody in general, everybody's going to have a good time. Hopefully they're not drinking, but they're going to be having ribs and hamburgers and hot dogs, and they're just going to have a good old time and stay as cool as they can, right? And they're going to have a memorial service across the street, the parade, I don't plan to be there, and so on. They're, they, they, they're going to have, in general, a good time. Folks, God is good to lost and saved people. Look at here, verse 17, in there, our first point, the goodness, the goodness of Christ. And Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Now, folks, we got, uh, you know, I got a man, he comes in, he puts on that, you know, if I leave, I tell him, I don't want, no. but he'll turn on that rock. <coughs> now, does that soothe you? It, it, it's racket. It does anything but soothe you. But he, he, uh, David was to come to Saul to play well and to calm his spirit down, which is the goodness of Christ, which is extended toward all men, even the lost. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. It troubled him. And all lost people have this. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, it worketh in the children of disobedience. And they ruffle their, their feathers and they ruffle their wings and do a little flying around and they trouble people. Saul met David, David a type of Christ, before, before David killed Goliath. Ever wonder about that story? I always wondered about that. This world is a troubled world. And they need a hand of mercy extended them. Folks, Jesus works through us to extend a hand of mercy to people. To lead them in the way of repentance. There is a verse about this. 
The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Amen? Saul troubled, needed a comforting hand as do all lost people. Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. David was a cunning in playing. In other words, he didn't make mistakes. You know, you're, you're playing along and all of a sudden, you know, you get that mistake. And, you know, right? It hits the wrong chord. You know, it doesn't feel good. But he was cunning in playing and a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent in matters and a comely person and the Lord is with him. You wouldn't think that a, uh, that a, a mighty man in war could sit there and play and it does state he played the harp. When you think of playing the harp, what do you think of, a man or a woman? You normally think of a woman. By the way, how many harps are in this church? Three. There's one there, that is a harp. There's one there, that is a harp. And there's one up there, is a harp. There, you play it with these fingers on there. The other is, and they're color-coded. If you look at a harp, they can be color-coded. So you can sort out the white keys, you can sort out the, the, uh, the, the scale, and then the pedals are pushed so that you can hit the chromatics and get the black keys playing. All it is is a piano. That's all it is. Ah. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. Doesn't the Bible say, and of some have compassion making a difference? The rain fall, it, it, meaning rain in a good way. I mean, we need rain to make the corn grow, folks. The rain falleth on the just us and the unjust, the lost people. God's mercy is extended to all. As the loving shepherd looks for his lost sheep, and when having found him, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. As that story goes in Luke, <clears throat> God's last resort is harshness. Some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear. That's his last resort. As the next story in Luke 15, as the woman who sweeps the house looking for her lost coin, sweeping can be very uh, troublesome and, and tumultuous, such as world wars. There's lots of people who get saved during a world war, folks. You know your time is coming, folks. There's no unbelievers in foxholes, as they say. She lights a candle and sweeps the house. The goodness of Christ, it shows the goodness of Christ in that story that David came to Saul to play for him, to calm that, his spirit, troubled spirit down. Look at 1 Samuel, now let's turn to 1 Samuel 17, verse 55. Goliath shows up, David goes out there and slays him. Uh, what did he slay him with? A, with a stone, a, a smooth stone, all kinds of things in that story, tons. But this is all about Saul, the goodness of Christ. And then <clears throat> there is the recognition of Christ. One of the biggest steps in salvation is to recognize who Christ is. Amen? Amen. Goliath appears in verse 55. Look what it says. First uh, Samuel 17, verse 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, and the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Don't you wonder about that story? I mean, he, he should have known that David would show up and play, but he was oblivious to all this. Whose son is this? Saul wonders at the power and the strength of this lad David and asks, whose son is this youth? Just as Christ destroyed the devil by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, Christ destroyed the devil. Just as Samson did, a young lion roared against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand. 
<coughs> Samson did that, killed that young lion. Samson, a type of Christ, kills the devil with his bare hands. The lost refuse to see Christ. They see him as the son of David, but Christ shows them their error. He says this to the Pharisees because they quoted Psalms. The Lord said unto my Lord, that's what David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And he said, if David then called him Lord, how is he his son? Right? They were confused at that. Because, because it, it's, a, 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 it's Jesus. If you have never seen Christ as the Son of God before, may you today be as the centurion which saw the crucifixion, the earthquake, and the things that were done and declare as he declared. Truly, this was the Son of God. How do the Muslims see Christ? They see him as a lamb. In this Exodus 12. In Exodus 12, 3, they, they just see him as a lamb. How do the Catholics see Christ? They see him in the next verse as the lamb. They're not going to deny that that's not the same. They see him as the lamb. Right? They're at that point. But how does the saved man, the Christian, see Christ? In the next verse, they see them as your lamb or becomes their lamb, right? That's when a person finally gets saved. Not until Christ is seen as the Son of God. He will not become your lamb only if you make him so. Whose son is this youth? What a profound question that Saul asks is the best of questions any lost man can ask of Christ. Whose son is this youth? As said Pilate, behold the man that you say he made himself the son of God. Christ says he is God's son when Christ says on the cross, Father, forgive them. Right? He declares he is the son of God. Be as were the Greeks that asked, sir, we would see Jesus. Amen? The goodness of Christ to the recognition of Christ. Look at, at, at 1 Samuel 19. Now this, this story goes on and on. They say that Saul was a, a poor aim with the javelin, but Saul goes after David to kill him. And so not only is it the goodness of Christ, the recognition of Christ, but there are the haters of Christ. Look at verse 10. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away. David slips away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Now, folks, if this is a type of the Pharisees and a type of Jesus Christ, could those Pharisees kill Jesus? Of course you can't blame Saul. He may have been an expert shot, but he was unable to do it. It was impossible for him to kill him. <clears throat> and Saul sought to smite David even in the wall with the javelin, but, the, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. They led Christ to the brow of the hill that they might cast him down headlong, it says. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Right? A miracle. So too, in the treasury, took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. All kinds of miracles like that, that Jesus eludes them. He becomes, it, it appears in the Bible, becomes invisible. As there were haters then, there are haters now. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. The world preaches tolerance. You know, they want the, we want everybody, especially as Christians, to be tolerant. The world preaches tolerance. But in their world, tolerance is a one-way street. Amen. Tolerance, you know what? Tolerance is a, a, a Bible word. Here's how it appears. Tolerable. You know, I thought, well, you all look that up. See, tolerance is a, is a Bible word. It says tolerable. About it'll be more tolerable for a Tyre and Sodom than for them. 
See, in reference to how much hellfire the lost will receive, as compared to others who get hellfire. That's the only tolerance is how much you're going to burn. So ask yourself, why did the Pharisees hate Christ? Why? To give, they, because with Christ, they would have to give up the preeminence, which Diotrephes loved to have. So then, if that's a type of devil, why does the devil then hate Christ? Because he wants to be like the Most High, right? He wants Christ's position. That's that whole thing. That's what, why, why that is. So why hate Christ? Because sinners then must admit that they are sinners. You get the flow of this? It leads us then to 1 Samuel 26. Go there, 1 Samuel 26, verse 21. First Samuel 26, verse 21. These are all big and good steps for, for Saul. The conviction that Christ gives, the conviction of Christ, sin, which leads us to a profound statement by Saul. The confession of a lost sinner. It says there in verse 21, Then said Saul, I have sinned. Amen. That's a giant step for a lost man to getting saved. I have sinned. <clears throat> see, these stories are in here for our edification and for us to see Christ in the story throughout these stories. <clears throat> and then said Saul, I have sinned. Moses said, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets. Amen. That all the Lord's people were, were, were this way. And we're able to recognize these things. Oh, if all the people everywhere could be as it was which the publican which said this, God be merciful to me a sinner. Right? If we could all be like that publican, I have sinned, says Saul. If ever there was a sinner, should we say that about ourselves? If there ever was a sinner, I am one. The perfection of God reveals the perfection of God reveals the imperfection of man. Tis discovered when one compares themselves to Christ. As said by Job, Behold, I am vile. The Pharisee pray, prayed a prayer. Remember that, that prayer that they prayed in Luke? You got the Pharisee and the publican? The Pharisee prayed a prayer that of an angel, as if he were an angel, which he was not. The publican prayer prayed a prayer that of a sinner. May we say of ourselves, I am that publican. I have sinned. A great step towards salvation. Amen. Now turn to 1 uh, Samuel 20. 1 Samuel 20. Verses 31 through 32. This is when Saul is after Christ. He makes a profound statement to his son Jonathan. And this is our next point, our fifth one. We're almost done, folks, here this morning. The sacrifice of Christ. Look at verse 31 and 32. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth, Upon the ground, thou shalt not be established. As long as Jesus lives, we cannot be saved. He must die on that cross. Thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore, now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan, another profound statement by Jonathan. And Jonathan answered Saul's father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? Which is a true statement. What sin did Jesus do? None. What hath he done, says Jonathan? For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What hath he done? <coughs> Nothing. Because he who knew no sin was Christ. Christ said of himself, 
He must suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. What did Peter say? Oh, not so, Lord. So Peter and Jonathan are the same guy. John said, not so. Don't kill him. Then says Peter, has said, Jonathan, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. David flees Saul and resorts into the land of the Philistines. And Saul, and you know what it says? Saul sought no more again for him. If he plays the part of the devil there, the devil can't have him. The resurrection. The resurrection and the ascension. Cannot have him. He sought no more again for him. A type of the resurrection. Christ's sacrifice, his death, his burial, and resurrection. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Jonathan is like Peter. By David's dying, Jonathan, you will be established in your kingdom. By David's dying, we would then be established as being saved, and we will be made priests and kings in the millennium. By Christ dying, Peter... You will be established in your kingdom. We will be kings and priests. Amen. I hope we see that. Huh? Now, leads us to this then, the salvation of Christ. When does a man get saved? Look at 1 Samuel 24. Folks, this is not deep. Look at verse 17. He makes another profound statement. <coughs> he gets David. He could, have, he could have slain David, but he didn't. You know, I, I always feel so sorry for Saul. Remember, uh, one of his men go in there and they get the cruise of water and the spear, and he brings it back, and, or David, they go in there and he holds it up, and, but is Saul, and, and he cheers them out. But, but God put a deep sleep upon him. You know, I mean, what could they do? There's nothing they could have done. The salvation of Christ. Look at 1 Samuel 24, verse 17. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. There it is, folks. But look at verse 20. Behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king. When, when you admit that Christ is more righteous and that he is king, amen, as said Thomas to Christ, my Lord and my God, Said of Christ, this is what's said of Christ, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Worthy is the Lamb. Thou art more righteous than I, is the salvation of Christ spoken by, the, spoken by Saul. As said, the centurion, as said the centurion at the foot of the cross, certainly this was a righteous man. After three hours of darkness, Light dawned on the centurion, truly the first fruits of Christ's death, amen. Not a doctor of the law who got saved, not, nor a Pharisee, nor a Jew, but a Gentile soldier. Now think about it. What does a soldier do? They make what? They go and make war. Jesus came to make what? Peace. Nothing more fitting than to give peace to a man of war. Fitting, a man of war found the peace of God. Men fight wars to bring peace. Amen? No greater peace given man than through the war that was fought and won by Christ on the cross. Amen? Truly now, on earth peace, goodwill toward men, as the angel said. Saul truly, I believe truly, Saul plays the part of a great preacher. Thou art, thou art more righteous than I, and thou shalt surely be king. No better words could ever be preached. Then last of all, if we turn to 1 Samuel 17, verse 25, said by Saul, as the reward that would be given to the man that killed Goliath, which is da David killed a type of the devil, uh, Goliath. The reward of a Christ. 
And so Saul at this point then plays the part of God. The man who killeth him. As it says in verse 25. And the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter, that's the church, and make his father's house free in Israel. What part of that isn't that? House free in Israel. The man, which is David, that's Christ. Him, who he killed, Goliath, which is the devil. And the king, who gave these things, which is Saul, is God. And he, and he would get his daughter... His daughter, uh, the one that loved him was Michael, right? But which one did he get? Now, we're just going to throw this one out as just candy. How many of his daughters did he get? Anybody recall? Two. Two. He got Merib first, the eldest. Just like in the story of the... Uh, uh, La Laban, uh, what were the two daughters? Jacob, give me the two daughters. Rachel and Leah and Rachel, the elder and the younger. He gets Merib and he gets Michael. The elder and the younger. Faith and works. And the two girls are one. For the Amen, folks. It popped off the page for me uh, this morning, like off of, you know... Like a, like a flea, you know. The father's house, right? What did he say? Free? What free? His house? Father's house will be free? Heaven? The mansions? Millennium? Saul. We're done today, folks. Saul. A few named in the Bible. But Saul of Kish, by far the one named more soft. And I hope you have a good feeling about Saul now. Saul, good or bad? Was he good or bad? What say ye? A choice young man and a goodly, says God. Head and shoulders above all the people. Higher, the crucifixion. Kish played God the Father. Saul plays uh, Christ the Son. The servant plays the Holy Spirit. Arise, meaning the resurrection, and they went to get the asses, the lost, those who get saved. But what do they say bad about Saul? Why is Saul so bad, you know, right at the very end? He fell where? Say it out loud. He fell on his sword. See, there's nothing that can't be forgiven. Even that's forgiven. But in some people's eyes, they cannot be forgiven. But didn't Saul fall on the sword? Didn't he fall on the sword? Christ. Therefore doth my father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down to myself. See, Christ fell on the sword. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. If Saul was Christ, a type of, at that point, Saul had no choice. He had no choice. The rest of that verse about the power to take it and the power to, uh, to give it, to take it and to take it again, Jesus concludes with this, this commandment have I received of my father. Saul had no choice. He had to obey the command of his father. Amen. I hope you see Saul in a different light today. This theme of the crucifixion, the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, the loss, the saved, the power, the resurrection, is woven through the entire Bible. And folks, I believe I just scratched the surface. All right? We don't want to dig all day. We just scratched the surface. If you're not saved here today, you need to get saved. Trust Jesus. It is like the embroidery on the curtains of the tabernacle and the coat of fine linen. 
Ever wonder about what was embroidered there? And, you know, there was a man that was chosen to do that. And the man that could do that was Jesus. That's name. And, and he, what was, I, ever wonder what was on the embroidery? <clears throat> ever wonder what was embroidered in there? I'll bet you, I'll bet you we're going to see it up there. The, the whole story of Jesus is embroidered in there. Just like, you know, when they go in those, uh, those uh, what do you call those, pyramids. And they have all the, the, the hieroglyphics, you know, in there. And it, 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 it preaches some story, you know. The theme of the crucifixion, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the law, the same. The power of the resurrection is woven through the entire Bible. Like the embroidery on the curtains of the tabernacle and the coat of fine linen. Truly. Christ has shown himself through the lattice. I hope you have seen him today. Christ, our hero, the captain of our salvation. Shake hands before leaving. Amen.